Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, the explosive book of John Bolton, The Broom Where It Happened. Our guest, Guillaume Long, political analyst with CIPER, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, and Ecuador's former foreign minister. Guillaume Long, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Guillaume, what, what is your reading about, if you see it from far, the US, that a president, a very close ally, we're talking about the former uh, uh, analyst of security, and that is in the case of John Bolton, and uh, he's writing that book that really leaves in a very bad position the president. What is telling about the country beyond what is said in the book? I think what it says is that there's a growing consensus amongst all political sectors in the United States that um, Donald Trump needs to be voted out, I think, in November, uh, and he's being attacked from all sides. Um, well, I think what is most telling is how Democrats are using this book, despite the fact that John Bolton is, I think, uh, you know, possibly one of the most right wing figures in um, The in, in the United States, certainly in terms of uh, right-wing approach to security and to foreign policy, but the Democrats are loving it. I think it's it's rather um, cynical and you know actually even dangerous to sort of um, yeah to to give validity to give importance to um, such a person. I think John Bolton is a very nefarious person. In many ways, he was one of the most nefarious people in the Trump administration. In many ways, he's more dangerous than Trump because he's a true believer. He's someone who always uh, seeks a military solution or the most radical conflictive outcome to any uh, uh, conflict. He's someone who doesn't believe in di diplomacy. He's, he's someone who believes in, in bombarding peoples and creating uh, often huge human rights crises and humanitarian crises with uh, human rights abuses. He's someone who believes in sanctioning countries, which again, create often humanitarian crises. We're seeing it in many parts of the world. He's, he, you know, he's someone who's been frequently called a war criminal. Yeah? Uh, when he was ambassador at the UN, he was one of the chief proponents of the war in Iraq. He was one of the chief proponents of this huge lie about uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. You know, he's, he's by and large a very dark and nefarious character. Um, and yet the, the, the Democrats are using him in their campaign against Trump because everybody is so desperate to get um, uh, Trump out in, in November. I mean, you know, this, this uh, administration is obviously a very chaotic administration, a very uh, uh, unreliable um, an, administ an administration that does not respect uh, the traditional institutional uh, ma management, yeah, the traditional management of, of institutions in the United States. And so uh, Democrats are ready to use any voice, including John Bolton's voice, uh, to hurt uh, Donald Trump and his administration. Guillaume, when you live in the US and um, the mass media are talking about the quotes of Bolton, the national security advisor of Trump, uh, they're mentioning very specific countries all over the world, but not at all any American, Latin American country appears. Even uh, the region doesn't appear. So it seems like the world, for the world, for the regular American, the average American, Latin America is not there. Is there an explanation why? Yeah, I think it's uh, very sad, uh, and the book illustrates it well. Uh, that in the United States, there's so little importance given to Latin America. And actually, it speaks tons about how uh, docile, largely speaking, throughout its history, Latin American elites have been uh, in terms of their relationship with the United States, which is why in the US, there's constant talk of Latin America as the backyard, right? And right now, there's even a return of an explicit return of the Monroe Doctrine, right? Latin America or the Americas for the Americans, right? Um, And in many regards, U.S. national security doctrines from the 19th century onwards is about a docile Latin America, a hemisphere that essentially follows Washington and obeys and behaves and all these kinds of 
uh, very humiliating terms for uh, Latin Americans so that the United States can exercise its power elsewhere in the world so that the United States so that the United States can be a great power uh, and uh, you know um, basically uh, concentrates its effort in areas where uh, you know it, it sees its interests are most threatened or where it has most interests essentially Europe uh, now the Asia Pacific region and of course the Middle East because of of uh, the great energy reserves there. So um, Latin America is often forgotten. Now, when Latin America rebels, when Latin America rebels, we d when Latin America says we don't want this relationship with the United States, then there's a little bit more attention paid to Latin America. So when there was some attention paid to Latin America, where it was, for example, during the first decade and a half of this century, when a number of Latin American countries questioned this U.S. hegemony, rebelled against this U.S. hegemony in different ways and often very, well, I would say, respectfully, but say, well, hang on, we want a different kind of relationship with the United States. And then you get more, uh, more focus, more attention uh, given to Latin America. But when elites just align and behave and just do America's or the United States bidding, then obviously there is no coverage, the media is not interested, and it's just the backyard. And that's that is clear from John Bolton's book, and it's a very sad fact. And uh, in the case of Latin America, even though the, the massive American public is not aware of the book, it has an, an definitely uh, mentioning uh, Venezuela as the most important uh, uh, country that there are, he's reflecting what Trump was thinking and what he was thinking and what Pompeo was thinking. Yeah, so Bolton's book, I mean, you're right, the only real Latin American section is uh, a chapter on uh, on Venezuela called Venezuela Libre. Uh, it's uh, a chapter that really illustrates uh, the extent of the Trump administration's obsession with Venezuela. In fact, in many regards, the Trump's policy towards Latin America was Venezuela. That was almost, has been almost the only focus of the Trump administration in Latin America. And it's, it's an interesting chapter that really shows how uh, this policy of trying to strangle Venezuela and regime change policy, trying to overthrow through various coup initiatives, the Maduro government uh, has been carried out by the Trump administration and how people like John Bolton, of course, uh, but or others, Mike Pompeo, but I would say obviously John Bolton being the most radical actor in trying to overthrow uh, the Maduro government uh, and trying to push for all sorts of policies, mostly, of course, draconian sanctions, very aggressive draconian sanctions. And it's incredible, really, really shows to what extent these people, are, you know, are, I mean, people like Bolton are crusaders, are fanatics, are people who really believe in this um, sort of yeah, I mean, God-given right, the manifest destiny of the United States being able to impose its will everywhere in the world through some of the most horrific policies, some of the some of the policies that most hurt human beings and you know violate human rights, obviously, uh, and how John Bolton uh, sees the current U.S. economic sanctions against Venezuela, some of the, which are some of the most draconian sanctions in the history of humankind, and how Bolton yet still sees these sanctions as too soft, these sanctions as too soft, these coercive economic measures as too soft. It's, it's fascinating. It's very scary. Um, and it really shows um, Bolton so as one of the really radical actors of the policy towards Venezuela and Trump as the typical opportunist, huh? the person who doesn't really have firm ideas, who is really kind of following his, uh, the, the, you know, the, the sway of uh, the political context, who one day wants to uh, a military solution to Venezuela, you know, that nobody's really in favor of, apart from a few hawks, and the next day wants to meet Nicolas Maduro. So this kind of constant flip-flopping, very sort of Trumpian, uh, contradictory, uh, you know, uh, always changing his mind, uh, in opposition to the Boltons of this world who have purpose, who want to overthrow, who want to organize coups, 
Very interesting as well, the Venezuela chapter uh, about how, you know, Bolton pull, ho puts all his support behind Juan Guaido, whereas Trump clearly sees Guaido as a weak person, someone who's not capable, uh, is not up to the task of overthrowing um, Maduro, how Trump sees the Venezuelan army as firmly behind Maduro, and how Bolton always tries to uh, convince uh, Trump, his boss, that the Venezuelan army is about to topple Maduro. And it's a very interesting chapter in that sense, but it's also very scary and very telling about um, how these people operate and how you know, fanatic and fundamentalist some of these people, including obviously the author of the book, John Bolton, uh, really are. And in a way also, there is a, there is a quote in the book that show the despise that is felt in the White House, but could be the despise that is also felt in the US regarding our region when uh, President Trump, according to the book of Bolton, says it will be cool to invade Venezuela, because really Venezuela is part of the U.S. Is that the sense that they really can control Latin America like like puppets? Yeah, I think that's that quote, which is amazing that it's in the book, and it's amazing that John Bolton just says it as, and agrees with it. You know, sort of. I mean, he obviously criticized Trump in all sorts of ways, but you know, there is no questioning of the fact that Venezuela is almost a part of the United States on behalf of Bolton, right? And it it's really illustrates this kind of backyard, you know, the, the the thinking behind Latin America being the U.S.'s backyard. They they really think that they. They have a right to do this, you know, to topple presidents, to do whatever they, they want, to pervert the course of democracy, to violate human rights. You know, it's it's not a problem for these people. Uh, and, and it's really it's really fascinating how in the chapter on Venezuela, uh, there are no Latin American agents. You know, Latin America's Latin, the will of Latin Americans doesn't exist. And in fact, even the failure to topple Maduro, even the failure to organize a coup is not explained through the resilience of Venezuelans or through the fact that maybe some Venezuelans are Chavistas or maybe some Venezuelans support Nicolas Maduro. No, there's none of that. It's just the lack of U.S. purpose or because the sanctions are not strong enough or because uh, Secretary, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Mnuchin, is not uh, you know, on board enough with the sanctions regimes. You know, Latin Americans do not exist as people, as human beings, right? They, they do not have... It, it's it's really quite remarkable and it's a very colonial or neo-colonial imperial if you like way of thinking and john bolton is the best example of that and his book reeks of that throughout it's humiliating towards latin americans and it should revolt all latin americans who read that book of course and in the case of colombia colombia is mentioned also in the book and it's almost like a landing uh, point for the us to, or a springboard to attack this neighbor, Venezuela, and so on and so forth. What do you think about what the almost four years now of the presidency of Trump has done in Latin America? We have seen uh, really important changes. We're talking Brazil with Jair Bolsonaro, that his name is the Trump of the tropics. We're talking Lenin Moreno, that there is agreement for many, many uh, analysts that he is a traitor regarding the presidency of Rafael Correa. He turned 180 degrees to turn to the uh, right or far right. We're talking in the case of Uruguay now that is supporting sort of a military uh, autocracy and also they're pushing for the candidate that the U.S. is promoting for the presidency of the IDB, something that historically never happened because has always been a Latin American. Now the U.S. is proposing a candidate and Uruguay is just behind the position of the U.S. and Bolivia. They're not only like in Ecuador, they're also are trying to push the, the date of the elections in order to try to harm President uh, Rafael Correa's uh, uh, options and in, in trying up after the coup in Bolivia, uh, doing very, very nasty and illegal things regarding the Constitution. What is the legacy of President Trump and, and so on and, and Pompeo and, 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 and Bolton in our region? So I think the legacy of the Trump administration in Latin America has been absolutely nefarious. 
Um, I mean, a number of policies from the United States. We've discussed Venezuela, but also uh, its approach uh, towards Cuba when Obama tried to heal many of the wounds of the past. You know, cracking down again, reactivating certain titles of the Helms-Burton law, uh, all sorts of things that the Trump administration, bringing back the Monroe Doctrine in, all sorts of things that the Trump administration is doing in Latin America, very, very bad. And also you've got a group of right-wing Latin American governments who feel protected by the Trump administration. So when someone like Jair Bolsonaro uh, from Brazil says something absolutely horrendous or does something absolutely horrendous, well, Trump is there to pat him on the back. So it radicalizes a number of Latin American right-wing ideologically right-wing Latin American uh, regimes. Um, you know, when Janine Agnes uh, violates the human rights of, of Bolivians, uh, when she uh, attempts to uh, postpone elections or even uh, prevent the biggest, largest political party in Bolivia from running in the Bolivian elections, the MAS, uh, the Trump administration says absolutely nothing. And similar situation unfolding right now in Ecuador with Ecuadorian authorities trying to prevent uh, Rafael Correa's party from participating in the upcoming um, uh, presidential and legislative uh, elections. And the Trump administration probably, you know, patting the uh, Ecuadorian government, the Ecuadorian elites on the back and so on and so forth. So it's been particularly nefarious. You mentioned this scandalous uh, breaking of a taboo in many ways uh, uh, proposal from the Trump administration to name uh, a U.S. citizen at the head of the IDB, right, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, which has always been in the hands of a Latin American. And, you know, incredibly, a number of Latin American governments including Uruguay, Ecuador, Brazil, Colombia, and others um, being okay with it. See, it's actually really telling that a number of formal right-wing presidents from Latin America, including people like Juan Manuel Santos, including people like Sanguinetti, including people like Cardoso, including people like well, Lagos is maybe more social democratic, but a number of right-wing uh, sort of retired former presidents of Latin America opposing this, right? So it's telling that we do have a new right-wing in Latin America governing right now, and it's governing in the shadow of the Trump administration, in alliance with the Trump administration. So it's a particularly radical hybrid of conservatism that we have in Latin America, which is clearly encouraged by the Trump administration. And so, yes, the Trump legacy in Latin America has been awful, has been nefarious for all Latin Americans in our region. We have seen uh, we're about four uh, months and a half away from presidential elections in the U.S., and we have seen a significant drop in the approval of uh, Donald Trump. And uh, most of the analysts also say that this book is not going to help them. Is something could change regarding Latin America in the case that uh, Joe Biden wins the election? Yeah, so I, I think that it's important to bear in mind that U.S. policy towards Latin America has always been pro problematic, whether the Republicans have been in power or whether the Democrats have been in power. You know, I think that there have been significant problems uh, for Latin American democracy and democratizations, for Latin American human rights, for Latin American development, uh, and hurdles and obstacles put by pretty much all U.S. administrations in the last uh, decades. Uh, when there was a progressive uh, pro-modernity, I would say, even cycle in Latin America in the first decade and a half of this century, you know, U.S. administrations were opposed to this and, and hindered it in many regards. You know, sanctions against Venezuela started, on, started under the Obama administration, even if they were significantly radicalized under the Trump administration. However, having said that, as I've just argued, I think the Trump administration has been particularly nefarious. I think the Trump administration has encouraged authoritarianism in Latin America and a kind of authoritarianism we haven't seen in Latin America since the military dictatorships of the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, I, I think the Obama administration would have said something about some of the most extreme forms of authoritarianism we're seeing in Latin America right now. So I do think that a Biden administration uh, would be more reasonable in terms of denouncing some of these, uh, you know, real attacks against democracy. Um, so, you know, I mean, again, I'm not saying Democrats in power are a great thing for Latin America, because I think, you know, 
it's been twiddled and twiddled dumb in many regards uh, from one administration to another in terms of U.S. policy towards Latin America. But I am saying that the Trump administration has encouraged all sorts of fanatic, fundamentalist, extreme forms of authoritarianism in, in Latin America that we're seeing now that we hadn't seen since the darkest hours of the Cold War in the 1960s and 70s, and actually since the times we had military regimes in the region. Uh, Guillaume Long, thanks very much for joining us.